Hi, and welcome back. This is lecture one of two on chapter seven. I know, two lectures instead of three, right? So this chapter introduces the concept of work and energy, specifically kinetic energy. Um, now, one of the things that we need to do before we start talking about the material in this chapter is to discuss the term energy itself. Um, in uh, common day vernacular, the word energy has sort of been appropriated by, uh, by the average person to mean a whole bunch of things that it doesn't mean when you're talking about physics and how it's used in the sciences. So in order to better understand what energy is under the umbrella of physics, we should go back to uh, around 350 BC. Let me uh, write this here, 350 BC. And talk about the guy who came up with the idea, which is Aristotle. Now, Aristotle was an early Greek and uh, for those of you that know anything about Greek mythology, you know that the Greek had a very unusual relationship with their gods. Now, for those of you that are religious, I know you uh, probably feel that, uh, you know, uh, you have a, your own personal relationship with God, and of course you do. But um, the Greek relationship, at least in my opinion, was, was perhaps a little different. Not to say that it was better. Um, you see, the Greek believed basically that um, the gods control every facet of their lives. So what you're looking at here is a, uh, a movie still from, I think it was a 1963 movie called Jason and the Argonauts. And uh, what you're looking at here are a whole bunch of Olympian gods. You have Zeus, you have Athena, the rest of them. And they're all looking down on a chessboard that has people on it. Uh, this is pretty much the way that the early Greek felt that their relationship with their gods was. Um, and Aristotle, um, I mean, he felt the same. Uh, they believed in the fates. Uh, for those of you that have ever seen the... You know, the, the Disney Hercules movie, you know, the, the three sisters, the fates who weave the tapestry of life. And if they cut a string, uh, that string is, is a life, basically. The idea here is fatalism. Everything that happens is somehow ordained or is somehow just a, a move on a chessboard. So keep in mind, you know, Aristotle was a philosopher uh, and he believed these things. And, you know one of the things he set out to do was to try to, to somehow quantify, uh, you know, what, what it is that you were created for, what it is that, you know, that makes these moves on the chessboard happen, if you will. Now he called this stuff, whatever quantity you have that, that, that makes you, you know, uh, uh, follow the will of the gods. If you want to think of it like that sort of, uh, energy, Okay. Now, um, he actually, um, came up with, a, I think it was like four methods or, uh, four purposes, if you will, um, that, that sort of was his attempt at coming up with a physics that was, that, that sort of centered around this sort of stuff. And, uh, I'm not going to really get into those, uh, with the exception of one of them. And, um, that was one that was called telos, uh, which is, uh, your ultimate purpose. Okay. Now, so what do I mean by this? Uh, well, if you go back here and you look at the whole chessboard analogy, for those of you that have ever played chess, you know that, that you have, uh, you know, some pieces that, that you may sacrifice in order to get a better position. Um, you know, some pieces that, that basically are a ruse that allow other pieces to do their thing. So, you know, think of a pawn, for example, being sacrificed. Well, that would be that pawn's ultimate purpose. You, as one of the Olympian gods, making that one move that, that causes the pawn to sacrifice. That was his job. That was what it was created for. That's the reason why it's on the chessboard. Now, uh, on the other hand, 
you know, that, that pawn itself um, isn't always just being sacrificed. Maybe it has a couple of moves it needs to do before it actually ends up, you know, completing its ultimate purpose, if you will. And, and those actions, we say, would be dynamis. Uh, that is, you have the potential to fulfill your ultimate purpose. Uh, you're basically in waiting to, to do it. Okay, so for example, let's pretend that you are one of these pieces on the chessboard and it's uh, your ultimate purpose to, I don't know, um, push a kid out from in front of a bus. At some point, that kid uh, goes on to make other chess moves that, that for whatever reason win whatever game the gods are playing today. Okay, now you don't just go around your entire life pushing people out from in front of buses. I mean, that's what your ultimate purpose is. Sure, you don't know it though. So we say that you'd spend, you know, most of your life in a state of dynamis, a state of potential. You're waiting to fulfill it. Okay. Now, so this is a very philosophical, right? So anyway, uh, let's let's get back uh, more towards, you know, today. Uh, we'll say roughly, uh, you know, somewhere between uh, the 1600s uh, and the 1800s. Okay. And, and what you'll discover is if you, if you read physics literature, papers, and things like that around this time, you'll see the word energy being used interchangeably uh, for a number of concepts. So, for example, uh, energy was often used interchangeably to refer to forces. Um, it was also uh, used interchangeably to refer to this idea of, of what's called power, which is something that we'll be talking about next lecture. Okay. Now that said, uh, I want to be very clear, uh, forces and power are not the same thing. So what you have here is the same term that is being used to refer to two different concepts. And that's a problem. That's, that's what we call a problem of semantics. So, you know, um, I don't know how many people uh, who are listening to this have ever been in an argument with someone. And you realize <coughs> about, we'll say you know, halfway through the argument that really both of you are trying to argue the same thing. It's just that you're presenting things differently. And, you know, when you present things differently, you know, you're using your own point of view or your own perspective to, to, to try to understand it. And that's where the semantical argument comes in. Okay. That's where, that's where you have a, the, the issue. Isn't the actual issue. The issue is the way it's being presented. So in the sciences, we don't want to have any issues with semantics. For example, if I say the word energy, uh, everyone should be on board with what I mean. You know, if I think forces and the person I'm talking to thinks power, then there's an issue. We're not, we're not communicating effectively. Okay. So what we need to do is to somehow use the word energy uh, to mean energy. And the person who first pointed this out was a philosopher named David Hume. Uh, he lived, uh, I want to say roughly around, uh, what's it? mid 1700s maybe and he pointed this issue out okay so the solution was to actually to go back to the the origin of the word energy okay and say okay this is this is the rough idea of what aristotle had can we take this and overlay it uh you know over the physics that we're developing here you know in the 1800s or so and the answer is yes we can so so the idea here is if you think about, you know, Newtonian physics, which is what everybody's learning right now, and you think about what an object's ultimate purpose is as per Newton, and you think about Newton's first law, okay, uh, an object's ultimate purpose is to experience, we'll say, a change in motion. All right. Now, uh, that, that said, it doesn't always experience changes in motion, um, but there are things that lie in potential. They lie in waiting that can cause it, and those things are forces. Okay, so forces are like a dynamis. They're, they're, they're the thing that, that can cause an object to experience its ultimate purpose, which is to experience a change in motion. Okay. Now, so what exactly is energy? Well, it's, it's just an idea, literally. It's... Um, whatever it is that, that is inside of an object that, that reflects um, how a force causes a change in motion 
and and to get to that, to, to sort of get a better understanding of that, uh, what I'd like to do is to talk about our first big energy concept, and that's the concept of work. Now, work is a definition, okay? It's not something that you derive, really, like many of the other things that we've derived so far. Um, work itself is defined through what are called differentials, uh, small changes. So we would say a small amount of work that's done is defined as, three lines means defined, F dot dr. Okay. Now, so F is force. DR is like delta R. Remember, delta R was a change in position, right? DR means small change in position, differential change in position. And this right here is what we're familiar with. This is the dot product. Now, more on that here in a little bit. So let's just look at the units here. Uh, force, we know, has units of newtons. That comes straight from Isaac Newton. dr is a length, meters. And a newton times a meter is called a joule. This is the unit of energy. It's also a unit of work. Okay, It's abbreviated J. Now, that said, um, the full-blown version of work involves talking about taking something at position A along a ride, a path, we say. This is DR, the path. Okay, to position B. Now, this doesn't make a whole lot of sense to us, so let's draw a coordinate system because things don't make sense if they're curves or lines and stuff like that unless you have something you can refer them to. So, if you were to, we'll say look right around here in our journey from point A to point B, right around there, in this very small little, little section right here. And we were to take this little section right here and sort of zoom in like that. We know from our understanding of calculus that as you zoom in and you zoom in and you zoom in, you get to the point to where your curve looks like a straight line. Now, it's on that straight line that you define the derivative, right? So let's think of this very exaggerated small little straight line as being R. dr and r plus dr okay so dr is the small little trip that you're taking right here now what about f well f is a force that's being applied as this thing goes along the path now let's think about this so will you agree with me that if this is my path right here, we'll say this would be where R is. This right here is R plus dr. And this right here is dr, my path as I go from, from here to here. That if I exerted a force like this, here's my force. that only some of this force is going to cause this thing to experience an increase in motion along the path. So for example, if you think of this right here as being the angle between the direction my object is headed and the force that I'm exerting, it's this force right here that would cause, in this particular case, the object to speed up. It's this bit. And it's this bit right here that isn't going to do any good at all. 
So this right here, if you think about sines, cosines, and tangents, that is opposites, adjacents, and hypotenuse, it's the adjacent part that points along the path. Okay. Now that said, let's go back and think about dot products. I know it's been a long time since we talked about them, you know, since like chapter two. But remember, we write dot products, for example, between two vectors as a dot b. And remember, a dot b is the same thing as b dot a. That's an important observation. Now, there are two ways you can write this. You can write it as the magnitude of a vector times the magnitude of b vector times cosine of the angle in between. Or you can write it as uh, components multiplied by each other. Uh, ax bx plus ay by plus az bz and so on. So these are two different ways you can write the dot product. Now let's take a look over here, right? So this right here, the adjacent part, the part of the force that would be along the direction of the path that would actually cause this thing to experience a change in motion along the path. This is the cosine part, right? So this part right here would be F cosine theta. So if you look over here and you look here and you think of this as being F and this as being dr, here's F cosine theta. So really what you're asking here is how much of this force lies along the direction of the path that I'm taking. And I want to be very clear, the path here isn't being altered necessarily by the force. You're not changing the path. What you're doing is you're changing how quickly the object may move along the path. That's what we care about. Okay? So, this is a dot product. You can express it this way, or you can express it this way. In which way you end up using depends entirely upon the situation, whatever is the most convenient. That said, let's talk about what dr looks like. Now, dr is your path, okay? It could look like you're moving a little bit along x. You could also be moving a little bit along y. You could also be moving a little bit along z. It all depends upon the situation. Now, f itself is complicated. It could be constant. It could be a function of... of of x, y, and z. In general, it's not a function of time in this particular case, although it could be, and that gets a little more complicated. But the point is, is that it is some sort of force. And when we ask about the work, what we're asking about is how much of the energy is being transferred from your ultimate purpose to your potential or from your potential to your ultimate purpose from your motion or your change in motion to the force or from the force into the change in motion and this will become a little bit more apparent in the next chapter when we talk about conservation of energy now so typically the way this is written is not in differential form although this is how we usually start the way we usually write it is through integration form. Now, if you take a look at this, we're starting at position A and we're ending up in position B. We don't have a form for what our force looks like. We're just going to do this in general. So here's our equation. DW is equal to F dot DR. The total work that is done by this force between points A and B looks like this. You do what's called a definite integral. That is, your integral has definite upper and lower limits from A to B. On the left-hand side, this right here is just the total amount of work that's done. And we usually just call this either W or W going from A to B or from X to X naught or from X naught to X or whatever. On the right-hand side, this is the actual equation the thing that we would have to calculate in order to determine how much work is being done. Okay? So, that said, it's been my experience that with work, uh, it's best learned by example. 
So what I'd like to do is to table this conversation for a moment about work and go over here and take a look at this example right here. A person pushes a box of mass 50 kilograms, initially at rest, a distance of 15 meters. If the angle between the push and the direction the box moves is zero degrees and the force is 30.0 newtons, how much work is done by the force? So let's draw a picture. Here's our box. Here's our person pushing the box. Now, the path the box is taking is straight along the x-axis, straight down it, along the floor, we'll say. My force is also straight down the x-axis. The angle between my force and the path that I am taking is zero degrees. Okay. The mass of my box is 50 kilograms. And the distance, that is, if I start off at x is equal to zero and I end up here, is 15 meters. My force here is 30.0 newtons along the x direction. What I'd like to find is the work. What I'm given is theta is equal to zero degrees. From my picture, my starting position is zero. My ending position is 15 meters. My force is 30.0 newtons along the x direction. I'd also like to write this as X sub, uh, F sub X equals to 30 newtons. And I can write this as this as well. This is going to be useful to us here in a second. We'll see. And the mass of my box, which we're going to discover really doesn't matter for work, at least right now, is 50 kilograms. So we're going to draw a force diagram. It's not always needed for work problems, but it's a good habit to have. And I don't want to break the habit that we developed from talking about forces. And here, if you think about my box sitting on the floor, it has a weight. And as a consequence, it has a normal force acting on it. And then we have our push. Now the weight and the normal force aren't gonna matter. They're going to cancel each other out. And as a consequence, they're not doing any work. They're not causing this box to experience a change in motion. What is experiencing or what is causing uh, the box to experience a change in motion is the push. So normal force, weight, push. Now, you may or may not have to add up all the forces. I will, just to make a point, stop here with the net force. And if we need to, we can go further from this. Okay. What I'm interested in primarily is the force that's actually causing the change in motion, and that's this. So we start like I said, by writing down our differential work equation. So for a small amount of work that's done, you have a force acting on a small amount of path. Remember, this is the path, okay? So in this case, our path is straight down the x-axis, which means dr is going to be along the x-axis. Likewise, our force is using this form along the x-axis. 
So when I dot them, x dot x, the x hat dot x hat, this is a unit factor. It has a length of 1, and these are parallel to each other. What that means is this is just equal to f sub x times dx. So the total work that's done is going to equal to, and we'll just say going from 0 to x. f sub x dx. This is the integral that we need to do. Now, so <clears throat> the rule that we want to use for integration for doing this looks like this. If you integrate dx going from a to b, this is called a definite integral, you get x evaluated from a to b. Now what this means is, is you plug in b into whatever this is, which is x, and then you subtract away the bottom limit, a. This right here is the rule that we want to use. The reason why we want to use this rule is because integrals, just like derivatives, allow you to pull the constant on the outside before you do any work. The reason is because if you use uh, the product rule to do, um, we'll say, a, a derivative, then uh, when you end up taking the derivative of a constant with respect to whatever it is, you end up getting zero. So it doesn't factor in. You can just pull it out. So here is our integration rule. I'm going to go from x naught to x, noting the fact that the lower limit is zero. Now, this is going to be, when you do the left-hand side, this is just the total work. We're just going to call it W. Now, this should look familiar to you. From, uh, you know, Chapter 3, this was your displacement, right? F sub x times the displacement along x. Now, it turns out that this particular form right here, as long as your force is constant, is pretty consistent. And in fact, a general rule for calculating the work with a constant force is that it's f dot your displacement vector. And this is something that you're going to want to write down right here and put in a big star. And in fact, I'm going to put it over here and just sort of make a note of it. that right there. Okay, so that's an important one. But that said, uh, getting the work here is pretty easy. Uh, 30 newtons is the force. The limits of integration that we have, x was 15 uh, uh, meters, uh, x naught was zero. And uh, when you do this, I believe you get 450. Yeah. Yeah, 450. So here's your answer right here. Or for, Newtons. 450 joules. I'm sorry about that. Forces, right? Okay, so, so here's your work. Now, I'm going to point something out here. The work in this case is positive, but it's not always positive. I'm going to show you an example of that next. So in this case, this force did work on this. Your push did work on this box. And assuming the floor is frictionless, and we're going to assume that because we haven't been given any information about friction, 
When I'm done pushing this thing after 15 meters and I let it go, it's going to travel with a velocity greater than what it started with. So let's, let's, let's just keep that note in the back of our head. Positive work, and it's moving faster at the end of the day than what it started off with. Now, let's talk about this example right here. You have a rolling car that's pushed by a person in an attempt to slow it down. If the force of the push is 350 newtons and the force is exerted over a distance of 8 meters, what is the work done? Assume that the push and the direction of the roll are anti-parallel. So in this case, here's our coordinate system. I'm going to very poorly draw a car. Here's some wheels. Here's a person getting out in front of it and pushing on it to slow it down. Apparently they have three arms. Now, here's the y-axis, here's the x-axis. Now the car is rolling this way. We're not given any idea of what the velocity is, and it doesn't matter in this particular case. But we're going to assume that it's rolling, because it says that it's you know rolling and a person's trying to slow it down. We're not given what the mass of the car is. We're going to discover it doesn't matter. Okay. We're just going to say it has a mass of m. Now, here, this is the direction of the path of the car. This is the direction of dr. But the push is this way. This is the direction of my push. The angle between them is 180 degrees. Now, so, how much is my force? My force is 350 newtons, but it is along the negative x direction. Okay? My initial position here is zero. My final position over here is 8 meters. Okay, as before, I'm going to call F sub X 350 newtons, which means that I can write this as minus F sub X times X hat. So this is what I've been given. I'm trying to find the work. So again, you can draw a force diagram. I don't want to get out of the habit of doing that. There is a normal force. There is a weight. We don't know what they are, but we know they cancel each other out, so they don't matter, at least in this case. And here's your push this way. So now let's talk about the work. The differential work here is F dot dr. And dr in this case is straight down the x-axis again. Okay. The force is minus F sub X, X hat. So what that means is, is when you actually do the dot product, this is what you're doing. X hat dot X hat is one. But you got a minus sign out in front. Okay. Now look, it's the same as before. It's the same as before, except now there's a minus sign out in front. It's a constant force. Okay. So, immediately, we can write down what this is going to look like. F dot delta X. Or, since delta X is positive... that minus 
350 newtons times x minus x naught, which is 8.0 meters. Now, if you do this, you get 2,800. Minus 2,800 joules. So, so check this out. I think we can agree that because you're pushing in the opposite direction that this car is moving, that you're slowing it down. And look at the sign of the work. It's negative. So what I can see so far, just from these two problems, is that when you do positive work, you're speeding something up. But when you do negative work, you're slowing it down. So let's make note of that. Now, but, but, but what about situations in which the force is not along the path? Well, we can use this as a big hint, okay? So uh, just as a simple example, imagine pushing one of those little rolling chairs, like an office chair. So maybe here's your little office chair right here like this. So what if you were trying to move it along the floor this way? This is the path we want. But you push straight down like that. Now, from experience, I can say that no amount of pushing down on this chair is going to make it move to the side. But look at the angle between, in this case, delta R and our push. It's 90 degrees. Now, if you go back and you look at the dot product, specifically this one right here. Cosine of the angle in between. What's cosine of 90? Well, that's, that's zero. So what that means is, is that in this case, this force that we're exerting does no work. Likewise, what if I was going to try to lift the chair to get it to move side to side? No work. 90 degrees. It's only the part of the force that lies along the path that causes this chair to experience a change in motion, which is the reason why we use the dot product to describe it. So, if the force, we'll do it this way, if the force is perpendicular to or orthogonal to the path, no work is done. It's only the amount of force along the path that causes things to speed up or slow down. This is important. This is something you should remember. Now, I want to do another example. And in this case, um, we're going to deal with a force uh, where you absolutely have to deal with a free body diagram. So in this particular case, uh, we have a block that we're sliding along a frictionless surface. And then this block is going to come across a rough patch. So uh, here's Y, here's X. Uh, I'm going to put my block right here. It's moving this way, we'll say. Um, how fast is it moving? We don't know. It's just moving. Uh, that's the only thing I care about right now. And uh, here's the rough patch right here. It's going to start off, we'll say, at zero. And then when it gets over here, um, at x is equal to 1.5 meters, it gets out of the patch. Now, in this patch right here, there is a coefficient of kinetic friction 
of 0 0.25. We know the block has a mass of 25 kilograms. Okay. <coughs> so here's what I know. When it hits this patch, um, it has a weight. There's a normal force, but there's also going to be a kinetic frictional force that's acting on it to try to slow it down. So there's a kinetic frictional force, there's its normal force, and there's its weight. And um, here immediately you can see why we need to do a free body diagram. And that's because we need to figure out what the normal force is uh, so we can plug it into the kinetic frictional force and we can actually take and figure out the work that's being done. So um, what are we given here? Let me just write out the givens. Um, we have a mass of 25 kilograms. We have an initial position of zero. We have a coefficient of kinetic friction of 0 0.25. We have a final position of 1.5 meters. Um, and we're trying to find the work. So again, we're going to draw, uh, our force diagram centered on the block. You have your kinetic friction slowing it down. You've got your normal force as a consequence of the weight on the ground like that. Now here, the purpose of the free body diagram is going to let us, is going to be to let us to sum up the forces so we can find out what the normal force is so we can plug it into F sub K. Okay, so here, if you sum up the forces to get the net force, you have three. You have a normal force, you have your weight, and you also have um, your kinetic frictional force, and that's going to equal to m times a. Uh, now, what's going on in the y direction? Uh, you have a positive normal force, you have a negative weight, and that's equal to zero. What's going on in the x direction? Well, you have uh, your kinetic frictional force to the left, and that's equal to uh, m times a sub x. Now, this really isn't going to be relevant to us because we're not necessarily doing dynamics with it. Um, we are kind of, but we're doing it through work, and we'll see that later on. What is relevant is that we know that the frictional force is the thing that's doing the work. Okay, now it looks like mu sub k times the normal force. We know that from our discussion in chapter 6. Okay. So we need the normal force, and it's, we're going to get that from here. Uh, here, the normal force is just equal to the weight, uh, which is m times g. Okay, so what that means is, is that it's going to look like this in form. As a vector, though, it's going to look like this. It's in the negative x hat direction. It's slowing us down. Now, our path, though, is straight down the x-axis. So dr, in this case, is along x in the positive x direction, x hat. Okay. So, so if I write down my differential work as the force dotted with the, the, the displacement, or the, the path, rather, then it's going to be minus mu sub k mg x hat dotted with dx x hat. Now x hat dot x hat is just one. Okay, so again this would be what, what I would integrate, but, but we have a constant force here, right? So that means that we can use this. And the reason why I wanted to do this was to show you this is the approach we want to take in our minds each time. Okay? That's what we end up doing right there. There's our equation. So, uh, mu sub k, uh, 0 
the mass, 25 kilograms. G is just 9.8 meters per second squared. X minus X naught, one and a half meters minus zero. Now, if you take and you, uh, you know, plug stuff in here, So 9.8 times 1.5. I get, um, if, you, if you keep sig figs into account, I get about 92 joules, negative 92. And, and look, as, as expected here, we know friction acts to slow things down, right? And, and, and we get what we expect here. Negative work is being done, okay? The thing is slowing down. Negative work has been done. So <clears throat> we have three examples dealing with constant forces. What do you do when you have a force that isn't constant? Well, the truth of the situation is that it's a little more complicated. So what about forces that aren't constant? Well, you know, we take the same process as before. You write down your, your differential work for it. You integrate both sides, we'll say from A to B, wherever that is. But you have to integrate this. And here's the deal. Um, your force because it's not constant, could look incredibly complicated over the path from A to B. So you may actually have to break this integral up into pieces. You might have to do it, you know, for example, I'll just, you know, it's a simple example here. Let's pretend that, you know, you had a path that looks something like this. Okay, so here's your path. So just wanted to do this. So here you would actually have one integral that dealt with this part, another integral that dealt with this part, and another integral that dealt with this part. Why? That's because in this part, dr is along x. Here, dr is along y, and now dr is back along x again. So, uh, and, and the force at this position in space might look different than the force in this position in space might look different than up here. So you actually kind of have to construct your integral by hand and be very careful about your path from point A to B. And not only that, you need to do your integral with this in mind. Okay, so this is true no matter what. As long as you know that your force is doing positive work, you should expect the positive answer, and you might have to construct your integral such that you get one. So you have to really apply common sense here when you do this. You can't just monkey it out and say, okay, you know, plug in, chug, answer, because sometimes that doesn't work. And the, the, the most classic example of how this might not work would be with the spring force. So... <clears throat> What I'm going to do here is a generic example of the work done by a spring. Okay, and then we're going to apply it. Now, you can use this pretty much throughout, you know, any of the problems that you do in this particular chapter. But I, I'm, I'm doing this for a reason, because I want to show you the, the type of complexity that you might have to deal with. And I'm not saying, you know, and thus you don't want to do it. What I'm saying is that when you do it, you need to be kind of careful about it. So, for example, let's pretend that I have a spring that uh, has a mass attached to it, and it is anchored to a wall like this. Everything's frictionless. We're not going to even consider friction right now. Here's our spring this. 
Here is our mass, like this. I'm just going to call it M. Now we know springs are defined through Hooke's law. Um, Hooke's law looks something like minus K times delta R, right? So the minus sign here is, is a trick. I'd mentioned Hooke's law before, I want to say back in like chapter uh, five. And, and so the minus sign is there to remind you that the spring force acts to take and try to pull things back to the, to the equilibrium position. The equilibrium position is the position where the spring uh, doesn't have to exert any force on you to keep you where you're at. Okay, this is a manifestation of nature preferring to minimize energy is what we say. Now, so <clears throat> in this particular problem, I want to think about a spring starting off at the equilibrium position with a mass that's moving to the right. So it has a velocity. Okay. So here is our initial position. X naught is equal to zero. We're just going to keep it as X naught right now. Now, as it goes past over here, as it continues going here to, we'll say, position X, right? Will you agree with me? that the spring is acting on this thing to try to slow it down. It's trying to pull it back this way to equilibrium position. So this right here is the direction of the force, and this right here would be the direction of dr. So as, as you can see here, they're anti-parallel to each other. So if I were to write this force out, keeping in mind that my initial position here would be zero, I would say that the spring force looks like minus kx x hat. It's negative. It's in the negative direction. Now, dr in this case is along the positive x direction. Okay, so I expect negative work here to be done. To be clear, it's slowing it down. So, how much work is done? All right. Well, we start from the differential form, which is F dot dr. Our F in question is minus kx, x hat. We're going to dot that with dr. Okay. x hat dot x hat is 1. And this right here is what we need to integrate. Now, so, our work integral is this. We're going to integrate both sides from x naught to x. This is going to give us our total work. Okay. Now, that said, the rule we want to use for integration here looks like this. If you integrate from a to b, x to the n, dx, you get 1 over n plus 1 times x to the n plus 1 evaluated from a to b. Okay. Now, k is a constant. The negative sign is a constant. On the left-hand side, that's just the total work. So we are integrating x from x naught to x dx. Now here, n is equal to 1. n plus 1 is 2. n plus 1 is 2. So here, this would equal to 1 half kx squared. You minus sign out in front. Evaluated from x naught to x. Okay? So, if you plug in your limits... 
you put x into there, you subtract away x naught to there. This is the work that's done in this case. And as you can see, if x naught is equal to zero, you get negative work done. Now, this is something, like I said, that you can use. And I'm going to put up, uh, you know, let's see, what's a good place to put it? I'll just put it right here for spring. The work that's done is minus one half k x squared minus x naught squared. Now, in this particular example, what if you started at x and it was at rest and you released it and you let it go? Well, your initial position would be this. Your final position would be somewhere over here. It would be less than. So if you look here and you switch these, because now your initial position is greater than what you started off with, it would do positive work, which should make sense because this thing would be speeding up. If you released it from rest and you let the spring try to restore it back to equilibrium, it's going to be moving faster and faster and faster. Okay? So this works in general. This is, this is a good equation that you should be able to, to use. Okay, but if you were to try to do the same problem and just monkey through it, for example, what if you tried the problem where you started it off from rest and you let it go this way towards zero? Okay, this would be x, this would be x naught. If you actually do the math there and you're not careful about it, you'll end up with negative work in, in being done. Okay, here's your hint, and you can try this yourself. This would be the direction of dr. This would be the direction of also the force. The dot product between the two is positive, which means that you would be doing the same thing, except that there would be a positive sign out in front. The issue that you have here is that your initial position would be greater than your final position, and you end up with a negative sign. It doesn't work. So you have to be very careful about how you construct things and make sure that you ensure getting positive work when things speed up and negative work when things slow down. And that's because of the way the forces, the way the forces work. So here, <clears throat> just as an example, you have a spring with a mass of 0.22 kilograms. It sits on a frictionless table with one end attached to the wall. If the spring has a spring constant of 250 newtons per meter, and the mass is displaced 0.75 meters from the spring's equilibrium position. How much work is done by the spring on the mass to bring it to equilibrium? Let's draw our picture. There's that. Here's our spring stretched out. Here's our mass. We'll make it a big one. Zero point two two kilograms. Now, we'll say that this right here is equilibrium position. This is defined as zero. Our initial position over here, x naught, is 0.75. The spring constant that we have here is 250 newtons per meter. Okay. Now, so what are we given? Um, our mass is 0 0.22 kilograms. Our coefficient, or not a coefficient, our spring constant is 250 newtons per meter. Our initial position is 0 0.75 kilogram, or kilograms, meters. And our final position is zero. We're trying to find the work that's been done. Draw us a force diagram. Again, we don't want to get out of the habit of doing it. 
the mass that's on the table, there's a normal force because of the weight. Let me fix that. Ah, come on, what's going on here? There we go. And then you have your spring force trying to restore it back that way. Uh, let's not use a cursive, Eric. There. Normal force, weight. This is really as far as we need to go with this. Because we know from um, previous arguments that this right here is going to be the work that we're going to do. We want to use. We, we, we want to use this equation right here. Well, I want to let's face it again. That's fine. We'll do it again. I don't like that. Let's copy. And let's go over here and paste like that. So this is really what we want to use since we already derived it. And see, that's, that's, that's another thing, too, is that once you've gotten these equations, you, 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 you don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, unless you want to, you know. So, so here, the equation we want to use for work is minus 1 half k times x squared minus x naught squared. Now, k is 250 newtons per meter. Um, x is our initial position. Actually, our final position is zero. Uh, X naught is uh, 0.75 meters. So when you do this, you get um, going with the sig figs that we have here, uh, 70 joules. Yeah. So again, we expected positive work. We got positive work because the spring is making it go faster. Okay. So that's enough for this lecture. Uh, next lecture, we're going to talk about um, what this work does. Okay, so we're going to have a conversation about kinetic energy, and we're also going to look at something called power. And I'll see you then.